So, uh, uh, yep. Job, are you ready? Job? Oh, give okay, job. right. So, go, Mike. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode five of Beyond Birding series here on the Asian Bird Fair online club. With Victor Yu in Taipei, I'm Mike Liu in, the, in Manila. Uh, thank you for joining us here on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Our guest tonight is an American expat. He's the Director of International Affairs of the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation, uh, Mr. Scott Persner. Ni hao, hao jiao bu jian. How are you? <laughs> Doing good, Mike. Nice to see you again. <laughs> We're excited to hear your presentation. So if you're ready, right? Mm. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Scott Persner with helping to develop Taiwan's first national bird report. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, let me just do the share screen here and put that. And then, okay, can, can everybody see it okay? Yes, excellent. Okay, excellent. All right, well, good, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight and thanks to the ABF for having me uh, in order to talk about developing Taiwan's first national bird report. Again, uh, my name is Scott Persner, and I'm the Director of International Affairs for the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation. And so tonight, basically, I'm going to be uh, explaining uh, Taiwan's first national bird report, the history of how it came about, what it discusses, and also adding some uh, short piece about uh, my contributions to it. Uh, and so before I uh, talk about the report, first, I'm just going to, uh, let's see, how do I move it here. Okay, first a little bit about my organization, the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation. Uh, the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation was founded in 1988. It was founded by bird societies in northern Taiwan, central Taiwan, and southern Taiwan, and its purpose was uh, bird watching, research, and, and conservation through outreach and uh, environmental education. We are also the umbrella organization for 21 different conservation groups throughout Taiwan proper and its outlying islands. I may bring up the names of certain members uh, of our federation and uh, it, they all have different projects and things going on. However, we always lend a supporting role uh, or help them to represent their works uh, in meetings and, and events abroad. Uh, so here just to show you, uh, oops, some of our, our partners here. So here's uh, all 21 of our partners. Uh, the Wild Bird Society of uh, Taipei is one of our partner associations as is the Kaohsiung Wild Bird Society. And we have groups such as the uh, Wild Bird Society of Pingdong, uh, Matsu, uh, Jimen. So we have many partners who are doing many amazing things all year round, if it, even if it's uh, environmental education or uh, conservation studies. And so now I will go ahead and start the discussion about the State of Taiwan's Birds uh, 2020 report. So first, uh, the question is, what exactly is a State of Birds report? It's a good question. So birds are important indicators uh, of the health of the habitats, ecosystems, and they serve as a barometer for a country's uh, environmental situation. Oftentimes birds and birds needs for habitat are easier to study than other groups of uh, species such as fish, or amphibians. And so in that vein, many countries throughout the world publish national bird reports. And they use these national bird reports to serve as an important baseline of data for environmental conditions. And these bird reports are a type of early warning mechanism about environmental degradation. So countries all over the world have done these uh, kind of national bird reports. In fact, uh, Philippines did, one rep did their report back in 2014. And certain countries only do it once every so often. Uh, but other countries, such as in the UK, they publish a report once every year. However, for Taiwan, this was the first time, this was the first time that one was done. And so now a little bit of the history of where the SOTB 2020 came from. So it actually came from back in 2013. In 2013, there was a first meeting held between different stakeholders concerned about biodiversity uh, conservation. And they decided to create a national report to discuss the uh, bird monitoring and status, uh, trends for what's going on in terms of the bird species uh, found in Taiwan. 
they decided that in order to base this, uh, they would use the data collected on projects underway and species of concern. I'll discuss the, uh, the topics later on in the presentation. And then another reason for doing the SOTB report was because creating a national report was something that the Convention on Biological Diversity had set out and said that each country should go ahead and try in order to do, in order to uh, help the rest of the world understand their biodiversity status. Now, although Taiwan is not a member of the UN, uh, it still actively cooperates with the CBD in issuing uh, national reports on biodiversity. And also Taiwan has developed many policies and studies in line with international trends for conservation of species, biodiversity, and specifically birds. So at the bottom uh, there, you could see the picture that was on the bottom left, you could see the picture that came from the first meeting of what would become known as the SOTB, the State of Taiwan Birds Partnership. And so the group would meet every, every year, to every two years in order to discuss. And in that process, they also decided what topics they would uh, bring up and what items would be put in the final report. And so, oh, and so compiling the report would take quite some time. That's why they decided that 2020 would be the eventual year of release. Now, as I was just saying, uh, creating the uh, State of Taiwan Birds Report, it relied on uh, studies that were already taking place in universities and also being done by uh, government agencies. But also, I wanna just bring up right now the critical role uh, that citizen science played uh, and how open data played a major role in the creation of the State of Taiwan's birds. Because actually the report would not have been possible without input from uh, local residents and especially citizen scientists. And these citizen scientists and residents, they would put their information in places such as the eBird Taiwan and the TWF bird record database. So nearly 3,900 people contributed bird watching records and 472,000 completed bird checklists on eBird. If you look at the bottom right here, you can kind of, you can see that Taiwan is number seven in the world for completed for completed checklists. And something that's interesting is uh, Taiwan's recording of bird observations goes all the way back to 1972, because in the past people had been recording their own uh, birds uh, checklists and and uh, and observations, and then in the mid 1990s uh, the TWBF came out with the bird record database in which it could be entered in and logged in. And there was a website that people could have the records located in. And so we had hundreds of thousands of records just from that period from 1972 until the 1990s. However, it was in 2015 that the eBird portal eBird is an online portal for recording uh, your observations of birds. And so in 2015, the TWBF in coordination with the uh, to, uh, TESRI, the Taiwan Endemic Species Research Institute, uh, they went ahead and they worked together in order to create the Taiwan portal with the, in Mandarin Chinese. And they've also uh, had people working on going ahead and taking the data from the bird record database and inputting it into eBird Taiwan. Another fun fact is that actually currently that 472,000 completed bird checklists on eBird, that was from December of 2020. Now there are over 520,000 and there are over 4,000 uh, people who are contributing. So actually Taiwan is a very active user of eBird and also taking part in these kinds of citizen science projects. Another thing that Taiwan focuses on is keeping their data open. So for all of these major uh, citizen science projects that are going on, the data that is compiled, it gets put into TAIBIF, which is the Taiwan Biodiversity Information Facility, and also to GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. And I think it was just in July of last year when the uh, Taiwan government had announced that actually Taiwan was number two in the world, uh, not two in the world, two in Asia for their biodiversity observation records, just after India. And a major bulk of those observations were bird observations. And so you could see there 7.8 million bird observations have accumulated for the uh, Taiwan Biodiversity Network. And so now I just want to discuss a little bit about the different citizen science projects that are here in Taiwan, because they play a very major role in the uh, publication of the SOTB 2020. I'll discuss some of these in more in depth later on. So we have the Breeding Bird Survey Taiwan, which uh, looks at uh, creating a breeding bird population index. 
maps is a similar to bbs but it takes more scientific data then you have the new year's bird count which i'll discuss later ebird i've already discussed the bird record database lapwing survey Yulin, which counts uh, taiwan's northern lapwing visitors because taiwan uh, central taiwan's Yulin county may be one of the big uh, wintering hubs for the northern lapwing population uh, in in east asia the jacana survey taiwan which looks at the pheasant tail jacanas in southern taiwan's tainan county uh, the Blackface Spoonbill Conservation Network, uh, Bird Poison Report, and Window Collision. If you would like to learn more about any of these citizen science projects, you can contact me. I helped to go ahead and translate uh, a document, and I was the editor of the English version, discussing the citizen science projects for birds in Taiwan. And so now that, we, now that you know a little bit more about where the data came from, uh, let's uh, get into the State of Taiwan Birds 2020. So it, in essence, there are 674 species of bird which occur in Taiwan and 52 threatened bird species in Taiwan, uh, 29 species of breeding birds whose numbers have declined based off of data done by studies and citizen science studies, and 15 species of migratory water bird whose numbers have gone down. And so we, we have this information based off of the studies as well as following trends uh, after looking at long term data. So the 2020 National Bird Report is divided into three sections, the status and trends of Taiwan's birds, specific bird species, and major conservation issues. And one of the other major things that we used in order well, while doing the uh, National Bird Report was the red list of the birds in Taiwan. In the bottom right there, you can, you can see what the, uh, the red list of birds in Taiwan, the 2016 version was. Taiwan's first time to go ahead and actually use the IOCN, IUCN criteria for doing something like the red list of birds was back in 2004. And then again in 2005, they tried to uh, make it better. And then uh, they, the data that was from 2005, they updated it in 2016. And that 2016 report is actually uh, available in both English and Chinese. And so here, you can go ahead and see a summary of the red list of birds in Taiwan, as well as the different species and categories of species, which you can find here. Uh, Taiwan currently has 29 endemic species. There's rumor of a 30th endemic species potentially this year, but it hasn't been discussed yet by the TWBF's uh, bird record committee. And, and then there are 55 endemic subspecies, 69 non-endemic uh, non species, uh, and then you could see summer visitors 14, winter visitors 162, transit migrants 91, seabirds 29, vagrants 171, outlying island species, which are species that are more commonly found on Taiwan's outlying islands, such as Orchid Island, the Matsu Archipelago, or the Kimen Islands, as well as uh, invasive species. All right. And then here we have the status and trends of, of Taiwan's birds. The first section it was, uh, was broken up into four parts breeding birds, migratory water birds, migratory raptors, and breeding terns. So you could see the CS underneath breeding birds and migratory water birds. This is because for both of these sections, uh, citizen science played a very critical role in, the, uh, in, in collecting the data and going ahead and being able to write this section of the report. Uh, so here I'll show you the section from the breeding birds, because uh, the breeding bird survey was actually started back in 2009 by the TWBF in coordination with the uh, National Taiwan University's Institute of Ecological and Evolutionary Biology, because they wanted to make a breeding uh, bird population index. And then based off of years of data, then they decided that they wanted to try and create a, um, a, a breeding bird index in order to see if there have been any major changes in the trends for breeding birds in Taiwan over the last decade. Uh, that they didn't see any major shifts. However, there have been fluctuations and there have been declines in certain breeding bird species. However, for the most part, many are doing okay. However, the theme of uh, BBS uh, Taiwan is keeping common birds common. So actually now what they are doing is they're still trying to do more or, uh, environmental education and public outreach in order to let people know about the situation facing breed, uh, common birds and species that you might see more commonly, such as sparrows. And then for migratory water birds, 
Migratory water birds, this data is actually based off of what I was talking about earlier, the uh, New Year's bird count. And the New Year's bird count is actually based off of the Christmas bird count that they have in the West. However, because Christmas is not as is not popular or not, not very observed in as observed in Taiwan, they created it as the New Year's bird count. And also this was important because it was the first time that there was some kind of a in, national in scope survey of the wintering breeding birds in Taiwan that was taking place under the same under the same project. And so I've helped to go ahead and write the last two uh, NYBC reports. Uh, and also those two reports can be found in English as well as Chinese. And just as you can see here in uh, table 1.2.1, uh, you have the data from 2014 until 2019. And as you can see, the number of sampling areas and the number of volunteers have generally all gone up, as have the number of indiv individuals counted and records collected. So actually something special this, uh, not this year, but for the 2020 report was that they looked at three migratory bird hotspots, which are found in Taiwan. So if you look at my hand, my hand can be Taiwan. Uh, and so funny fact, this is actually how I had explained to my family where I was when I was going to school, because when I did my grad school studies in the south of Taiwan, I was in Pingdong County, which is the southernmost county. So if we're here in Taipei, I would just show my family members that I was down here in Pingdong. And so they could all remember where I was located, which I thought was very helpful. So anyway, we're gonna follow this same motif right now. And so there were three major areas of uh, migratory bird uh, that come to Taiwan. The first is the Elan Plain, which is here. The second is the Changhua Coast over here, which has many of uh, Taiwan's mudflats, the largest amount of Taiwan's mudflats and the Jianan Plain, which is here in southwestern Taiwan. And so here, if you look at the slide, if you look at uh, the bottom right section there, you can see that they've looked at the population trends and that for certain bird species, the population trends have been going down. Uh, and this is something that more research is needed on, but is, is something that people are keeping on the radar now. So that was the first section. The second section, which is the status and trends of specific bird species, there were nine species which we were looking at. The first was the black-faced boombill. Second is the Chinese crested tern. Third, the black kite. Fourth is the pheasant-tailed jacana. Fifth is the fairy pitta. A sixth was northern lapwing. Seventh was the russet sparrow, followed by the Australasian grass owl and the mountain hawk eagle. As you could see here, the black-faced boombill, pheasant-tailed jacana, and northern lapwing, all of those uh, the a lot of most of the data there, a lot of it came from uh, citizen scientists and local people who were helping in order to do the studies. So the one of the main stars of Asian conservation, because it has to this point been, it can, can be it can be considered a success, is the is the black faced spoonbill. And so this piece here was written by um, Mr. Mr. Shi Hong Wu of the Black, of the Taiwan Blackface Spoonbill Conservation Association. And so this just looks at the history and the current work that's being done in order to uh, help to conserve blackface spoonbills in Taiwan. The reason why we say that it's considered a conservation success is because when people first started learning about it and the alarm was raised by uh, Peter Kennerly about the blackface spoonbill in 1990, there were around 288 of the birds that were known. And as of last year, there were 4,875. And actually, in Taiwan, the 2020 census was, I think, around 2,800 uh, and something. And so still currently, 50 to 60% of the wintering black-faced spoonbill population is located here in Taiwan, specifically in southwestern Taiwan, in that area known as the Jianan Plain, more specifically in the Zhengwen estuary area. And so you could see here on the right, the, the orange is the uh, breeding area, the known breeding areas. The blue here is the wintering areas and the, uh, and the yellow is the uh, stopover areas. And so the, the, the regular lines, those are known migration routes and the dotted lines are assumed migration routes. And so here you could just go ahead and see the data that we have from the SOTB 2020 which uh, looks at the world's population of black-faced boombills and then the Taiwan count. Um, 
Taiwan takes part in the International Blackface Spoonbill Census, which is done by the uh, Hong Kong Birdwatching Society and the TWBF. We organize the count for Taiwan and help all of the different organizations and partners which are working on the census, which takes place, I think, the second week, the second weekend, the third weekend in uh, in January. And then here you could also see the uh, the proportion of how many blackface boombills there have been over time. And there, right there, the the Janan Penin, the Janan Plain there is uh, very very colorful, very very blown up because that's where most of the wintering blackface boombills are uh, currently. And so next we had the uh, major conservation issues. Major conservation issues we looked at were uh, climate change, invasive bird species, wetland loss and degradation the poisoning crisis, the wild bird trade, and the and seabird bycatch. Uh, so here we just have an example, which is the wild bird trade in Taiwan. Taiwan does not have a, a hunting problem essentially anymore. And as although there were hunting issues in the past, like you could see here, these were, uh, these were fairy pittas. And this is a photo from what I believe is the 1960s. However, now most of the uh, bird trade that takes place in Taiwan, it primarily revolves around the pet trade or around the Buddhist practice of, uh, of mercy release, which is where in order to ask for good blessings, you are freeing, you are freeing birds. However, many times those birds could be coming, coming from the wild. And so more study is, is needed, but one of the main things about the SOTB was to let a lot of people know what are the major topics that are being discussed in Taiwan in terms of bird conservation and who is working on them and how potentially these uh, groups could get in touch with us internationally so that way we could collaborate with them on these kinds of things in the future if there is a uh, area to do so. And then uh, seabird bycatch. Uh, seabird bycatch is a major issue globally and actually one that we are working on uh, in, in TWBF. In fact, currently, we have a collaboration with the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds on doing seabird bycatch mitigation because Taiwan is a major fishing nation and around 25% of the world's tuna fish is actually caught in Taiwan. However, studies done in the late, 19, in the late uh, 2010s have shown that there's very high overlap between uh, seabird foraging, which is in the uh, south, Southern Ocean. So basically south of uh, 25 degrees in the Southern Ocean and fishing vessels. So something that, uh, that Taiwan has tried to do is be a good uh, partner in conservation for this. And so they've developed things such as a national set of guidelines for how to do seabird mitigation. And groups like us at TWBF, we've been working with RSPB in order to uh, come out with things like, oh, hold on one moment. So we've been working with groups like RSPB in order to do a raise, uh, awareness raising. And we're trying to see if we could uh, do an experiment, in fact, on potentially better mitigation measures suited for uh, Taiwanese fishing vessels around the idea of something called a bird scaring line. A bird scaring line is essentially a long string with streamers that comes off the back of the vessel that doesn't allow the birds to get to the bait before the bait sinks. Because if the bait, uh, before the bait gets to about 10 meters, it has a very high chance of being able to got, uh, being grabbed by a seabird. And so once it is past the 10 meters, then it is considered safe. So we are trying to see if we could uh, do an experiment in order to see if it's possible to go ahead and make a, a bird scaring line better suited for Taiwanese vessels. And in the bottom right corner there, you could see a meeting that the TWBF uh, organized with industry, academics, and uh, local civil society in order to discuss this topic. Um, and so that is a general overview of the uh, SOTB. And so the SOTB, it, it finally came out in December of 2020, and it is both in Chinese as well as in English. And so something that we wanted to do is make sure that the data on the SOTB was open to everybody. And so at the end of the presentation, you should be able to see a link. And from that link, you would be able to go ahead and get to this page and download the State of Taiwan Birds as well as the 2016 Red List and the 2020 TWBF Checklist of the Birds of Taiwan. 
okay? And now looking towards the future. So for the future, uh, the, uh, the creators of the SOTB feel that uh, it is important to keep up this good work because the SOTB is actually an important milestone in the uh, Taiwan's conservation of birds work. And however, many birds and their habitats have not yet received attention. And so more conservation resources are needed towards that end. And so uh, just again, that uh, as birds don't know borders, Taiwan's conservation work follows things such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and we will continue to share this data with the international community. The idea is that hopefully the SOTB of Taiwan will be able to come out once every two years. And as it does that, it would include updates on the status of Taiwan's birds, as well as highlight the, uh, the latest stretches of projects underway and achievements in bird conservation. And so uh, these are some of the, as you could see, it's a, it, was a, it was a very big undertaking putting together the state of Taiwan's birds. And so uh, even though it was the TWBF and the Taiwan Endemic Species Research Institute which put together the entire report, you could see here all the contributors, but this does not include the thousands of people who through their citizen science data contributed to the effort to create Taiwan's uh, state, of, state of Taiwan's birds. And then here you could also see the contributing organizations. Um, and this whole project was sponsored by the Forestry Bureau under the Council of Agriculture Executive UN. And now for more information about TWBF, you can follow us on Facebook, we have Twitter, and we have Instagram. We have found that it's a successful, it's an effective way of going ahead and reaching out, talking to people, and showing the good work that's going on here in Taiwan. And we actually also did a very big, uh, uh, a very big push to show everyone the work that was being done for the state of Taiwan's birds. We also did a Facebook live session for the um, new for the press conference that we held for the uh, for the release of the state of Taiwan's birds. And so again, if, if you see here, you could see the web page for the state of Taiwan's birds. We also have an English language website. So that is my presentation for the moment. Oh, uh, and so if you, I would like to open it up to you now, if you have any questions or comments, uh, I really wanted to, this to be more interactive. So I was hoping that I could go ahead and have some questions from everyone in order to make this uh, uh, more interactive. So thank you. That is my presentation for the moment. And uh, I look forward to talking with you all. I guess I will stop sharing my screen now. All right, thank you very much, Scott. It's really impressive. Thank you very much. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, questions, please. Uh, Gom uh, Gombo from Mongolia. Can I ask? Uh, uh, gr uh, great presentation, great work. Well done. Thank you. Um, Ebo Taiwan. Is it originally developed by the eBird or is, is it modified for, for the Taiwanese birders? Could you give, give us a bit, a bit detail, or well, it shouldn't be detailed information uh, on, on, the, on the platform, please? Okay, sure, no problem. Um, eBird was, was developed first by the uh, Cornell Lab of uh, Ornithology. In, in 2002. And so many people thought that it was very helpful and effective way to, to put uh, bird observations in. However, there was no traditional Chinese language platform for Taiwanese birders. And so in that case, what happened was the Taiwan Endemic Species Research Institute and the TWBF worked together with Cornell Lab in order to go ahead and, and create the Taiwan portal. So in terms of the Taiwan portal, it's the Mandarin language platform. So it does link back up with eBird and you can actually go and see Taiwan's information on, on eBird. All that data and all the checklists that have been collected, they are all there. And Taiwanese uh, and TWBF and Testry have been working very hard to still integrate all of that data from the uh, uh, bird record database. 
So that has been taking a little bit of time because it's all volunteer effort. And so we've got a number of those of those checklists in as well. So if you have ever have you ever if you've looked at eBird before and you know that they have like the little blue bubbles over the certain areas for historical data. So there are all of those and some of them go back as far as as 1972. All that data is accessible to anybody who looks for it on eBird. Also, for information such as the NYBC or the uh, or the Spoonbill uh, census or things of that nature, all that data is also able to be found in the in GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, you mean they, it will be a bit difficult to develop, like. Uh, I'm I, just I'm thinking about not uh, not not now mm. uh, about the development of the uh, eBird for Mongolian birders. Well, so, uh, hmm. the, we're going to use the not Mandarin. Uh, we'll use the Cyrillic. Oh, oh no, so absolutely. It be, uh, is it, well, my question is: is is it really difficult to develop this kind of platform, or? Um, hmm. Well. Uh, that's a good question because actually I do know that like our friends in Japan are also trying to develop a Japanese platform uh, from what from what I had heard, and so they are for them it would be trying to put it in the in the Japanese language for Japanese birders, and so if if you want after this I could try and give I could send you the email and you could contact the folks there and you could have a conversation about it because when it was started in. In 2015, I, I was not uh, involved in it. However, yeah. uh, it did take time, of course, to go ahead and set it up because you need to do it all in the, in the native language, which does mm -hmm. take time. Mm -hmm. However, it was possible and, and it took place and it was really helpful because yeah. um, a lot of people were able to then go ahead and use it. Right, Gumbo, uh, actually you may contact uh, Chris with uh, the, the uh, eBird team, you know, uh, I can give you the, 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 the email and you can get help from him. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Yeah, and, and Scott Weavers. Uh, yes. Scott, yes, Hi. please. Okay. Yes, very good presentation. Thank you very much. I was just wondering if you have any recommendations in these reports for the government or any other officials? Uh, my, one thing that comes to my mind is the Elon plane. There's a lot of development mm. there, and it's a very critical habitat. Yeah. And I just wonder, mm. do you work with the government on those? Oh well, that's that's a that's a good question as well. And actually, one of the reasons why we wanted to why this why they wanted to develop this report was in order to show the government that these are some of the more important topics and some of the major conservation threats potentially to birds in Taiwan. And the Elan Plain is kind of special because actually, like you've said, there have been a lot of development going on in that area. Because uh, for those of you who haven't been to the Elan Plain, in the past, it, it's an alluvial plain. And so now it's actually, it's very flat and it's very good for rice paddy cultivation. So there are tons of rice paddies over there. However, there have been two sets of developments which over the last mm, few years have been going on rather quickly. One is the building of, of mansions or big homes and the other is for factories. And so unfortunately at this point, it's not possible to go ahead and say that one leads to the other, that the development is directly leading to the, um, the, the, the disappearance of these, of these, of the, the decline in these bird numbers, because more study, more specific study to this is actually needed. However, it is able to go ahead and then still be given to the government and actually our uh, organizations, because actually TWBF, we're an NGO, so we are non-governmental, but TESRI is quasi-governmental. So they are often working with the Forestry Bureau uh, under the Council of Agriculture. And we ourselves are able to go ahead and talk with the government uh, about the topics that are raised within the reports, as well as provide recommendations. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. Mm. No, thank you. Right, uh, and Scott, I know that there are um, so many people, you know, they uh, contribute their effort to this project. But mm. I, I want to know that, that how do you, uh, like, TESRI or uh, TWBF motivate people to 
or birders to join the project? Well, I think that one thing that's very special in, in Taiwan is that there, uh, ever since Taiwan was able to have uh, civil society organizations uh, back in the late 1980s and early 1990s, many people wanted to join and take part. So there was a very, very strong core group in many local areas in the beginning. But now that those, but once those organizations uh, were matured, they did a lot of outreach with with local communities. So working with uh, local communities and doing educational outreach has been really, really important to go ahead and get a lot of people uh, on board. I know that for the NYBC, what they've done is they've held events for NYBC participants, like pizza parties or something like that, in order to get people to come and talk about what they've done and discuss their observations, you know, make it more social, make it something that people can enjoy. Uh, in a case that, uh, that is not actually in the SOTB, but about the gray-faced buzzard conservation, which happened in central Taiwan's uh, Changhua County, uh, I, there's an event called uh, Bagua, Free Buzzard at Mount Bagua, which uh, goes ahead and looks at the migrating uh, gray-faced buzzards coming from Philippines. Uh, and crossing through Taiwan, because in the past there used to actually be a hunting problem of gray-faced buzzards. However, now the problem has essentially been eliminated in Taiwan. And what they did in Changhua was they did the scientific study, but they also did education activities for children. And then those children would talk to their parents who are potentially the hunters and say, you, you know, these birds shouldn't be hurt because, you know, they're important and they're beautiful and we, you know, developing relationships. And now the Free Buzzard event, which just had its 23rd anniversary last month, yeah, last month, it, uh, it, uh, was, it was a big success. And it's one of the biggest uh, community conservation events, I would say, uh, in, in Taiwan, as opposed to Taiwan's largest uh, international bird fair, which is held by WBST, our partner in Taipei. So really, it's important to go ahead and work with the locals. Uh, and so actually another, another example, in fact, is in the story of the blackface spoonbill, because our partner, the Wild Bird Society of Tainan, they, uh, they worked very hard in areas like Sitsao, which is south of the Tsongwan estuary, where you find many uh, of the blackface spoonbill. And at the same time, other organizations like the BFSA, which I mentioned, who wrote the report, were north of the Tsongwan estuary in uh, the area of Chiku. And they worked with local people in order to go ahead and do outreach education. And actually now the, um, the Forestry Bureau uh, was working with, uh, with the Wild Bird Society of Tainan to do something called the Happy Milkfish uh, Initiative, which was a kind of green labeling uh, to go ahead and make a blackface spoonbill and other species that also share the habitat of blackface spoonbill uh, friendly aquaculture. And so back in October, November, there were two events held with uh, TWBF being the organizer, but it was run by uh, WBS Tainan. And then these events are also taking place uh, this spring as well. So really going ahead and A, environmental education, B, having it at the local level, and then C, putting it uh, in a way that can make people feel the actual benefit as well. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Mm. And, 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 but, uh, what do you think the, 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 the data quality? I mean, these these birders out there are not really, you know, specialists. They're, they're birders, mm. and I heard, you know, uh, in like the uh, Christmas bird count in the U.S. in the early years, because you know uh, most people are elder people, and maybe they work half days, then and, yeah. and they, they they just you know the rest of the day they enjoy the tea, then you know. Mm. And, oh well, actually, they work. But so what do you think about the quality of the data? Oh, well, actually, NYBC is, is pretty special because it's one of the more one of the most popular events, because actually, uh, if, if you want to do another uh, presentation, I could do it on the citizen science projects, Victor, because right, uh, right. NYBC is a really great example, because actually what they did is they developed an entire set of uh, bird swag for the volunteers. Essentially, they have a thing called they have a spring couplets where they go ahead and they it's a it's a four letter idiom is a four character idiom but they go ahead and incorporate the bird that's the uh, mascot into that couplet wishing good luck they also have a towel that they go ahead and give participants as well as a sticker and they in the report they ask they're able to uh, fund four groups from colleges so that college students are able to go and get involved and help to finance their ability to do it and then also they have 
have them write a, a little report to talk about their experience in doing the NYBC. So, and then they also connect them with people who have done uh, surveys in the past. So that way they're able to go and, and link up and feel a connection with those who have done it before and feel like they're connected to this, uh, this bigger project. So it's one of the, it's, it's been really effective in that way. So actually every year there have been more and more uh, sample areas that, they, uh, that they've been able to go ahead and have for the NYBC. Wow, fantastic. Thank you very much. Hmm. Comments and questions, people? Hi, Scott. Uh, we've always looked up towards uh. Uh, Taiwan, like what you're uh. doing in Taiwan, like uh, is like a model country for us, like in, in terms of conservation, bird watching and the like. I was just wondering, uh, have you, before going to Taiwan, are you, were you a bird watcher or have you been involved in conservation work and what have you learned from Taiwan? Hi, y'all. This is a <laughs> difficult, what, what kind of a question is this, Mike? <laughs> we're not supposed to get personal during the ABF talk, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a plenty of platform, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So uh, basically, I, I, I am not, I am not a, a Taiwanese person yet. I am still American at the end of the day. I have been in Taiwan for over 10 years, though. And actually, uh, when I was doing my master's in, in Pingdong, I did it in pangolins. So I did, I did do some mammal study uh, in the past. However, prior to uh, coming to Taiwan, I had helped with many bird studies in Alaska. So I helped to do seabird counts and uh, seabird e experiment preparation and also rehabilitation in uh, Seward, Alaska. And then in Australia, I have helped to do PhD studies on satin bowerbird. And then in Oregon, I, I worked at the, uh, the Cascades Raptor Center on um, raptor, raptor rehabilitation and uh, uh, environmental awareness and environmental education. So I have, wor I, yeah, I have worked with birds uh, for most of the time since I have graduated uh, from school. However, uh, it's really a difficult open-ended question. What have I learned from Taiwan, Mike? You know? <laughs> 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 oh, I, 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 I've learned, um, many things, you know, you're putting me on the spot right now. And so it's, <laughs> it's uh, but uh, no, I mean, I've learned from, from Taiwan that, uh, that there are amazing things that you could do if you can, uh, you know, get the community involved, if you can go ahead and create these kinds of projects. And if you have uh, set goals in mind and also ways to go ahead and build up a community around the ideas of conservation and how to go ahead and, and hold events and also how to run certain and run projects, but also how to go ahead and keep open and, and do your best to work with others. Because one of the major things that I always see is how uh, the Taiwanese researchers and, and like our group, we're always looking for others to go ahead and help share what they're doing or trying to go ahead and, and learn from what's going on outside of Taiwan and keep this, uh, this kind of a dialogue going. Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should ask you, what did you learn from Taiwan, Mike? <laughs> not, not. <laughs> oh, and so here, here, here's a question. Does anybody know uh, what's, do you know what this is, Victor? What species this is? I know it, I know. <laughs> it's a penguin. <laughs> I'm not going to say that, you know, because I'll, I'll, I'll just guess it. Okay, that. does anybody, does anybody know what, uh, what species this is? It's one of the endemic. Mm. Right, so one of the endemics. Yes. It's the Yuhina, right? No. No, no <laughs> not the Yuhina. <laughs> but show the cover again, Scott. Okay. Yeah, we've got this guy here. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas? It is it is a Taiwan endemic. And yeah. it's a very special Taiwan Time endemic. Global? Oh yes. Wow. You win. You yeah. win. It is a science bowl. Yeah. Yeah. 
the Steyn's Bulbul was, was chosen as the uh, representative to go on the cover. And actually also, uh, oh, my presentation was in there, but uh, yeah, this cool little USB cool. that they created for the, uh, for the release of the uh, SOTB. But it was chosen because it's an it's an endemic. It's also a very very restricted species, a re restricted range endemic, because it's only found uh, in Huadong, in uh, Hualien, in Taidong, and, and parts of Pingdong. However, due to issues related to things like genetic pollution and, and loss of habitat, things like that, the Stian's bulbul is is threatened and it's vulnerable. So it's current and it's uh, it's it's common now, but there's a chance that it might not be common in the future. Uh, and so that it was a species that we wanted to raise awareness of because it's a Taiwan endemic. Another species, which is actually uh, an endemic subspecies of Taiwan, which is currently critically endangered here, is the, uh, the ringneck pheasant, which is also found in Hualien and Taidong. However, because of habitat loss and things like that, it's now also very, very threatened. So, but we chose the Steins because it is, it's the endemic species here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May we ask that, you know, uh, when there's a next ABF, so uh, could uh, we, everyone you know, can get one from, from ABF, from, from, from you, mm. is that possible? Wait, what? To, to get the, the, uh, the, the flash disk. Oh. It's a souvenir, you know, when. Oh, you, you have to ask Alan about that, Victor. You have to ask the oh, Secretary yeah. General. Yeah, that's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the Director of International Affairs. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Hmm. But uh, does anybody have any other other questions? Yeah, uh, Tingai, do you have any uh, comment on this? Oh no, Victor, <clears throat> I'm just watching. Excuse me, uh, we don't hear you. Hello, huh? Tingai. Um. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, please. Yeah, maybe. Oh, do, maybe do you want to write the question? Is yeah, yeah. Is the connection? Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, can you oh, hear me? Uh, no question, yes. really. No question. Okay. Comment? Okay. Uh, you know, my, my aunt said that she was going to be watching this from Pennsylvania, but mm -hmm. I, I don't see her. So I, yeah. otherwise she definitely would have asked a question. I was. <laughs> uh, good evening, guys. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Sorry, I was late this evening. This is Madi from Cambodia. Hi, Marty. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I actually, uh, I, I, I did love your presentation and also uh, I, I went to uh, Taiwan last time during the mm. ABF. Oh, okay. And, yeah. And uh, I also spent like a few days uh, doing birding myself with my team. And mm. it was really a great trip. And we saw many, many species, especially mm. the endemic species. But mm. I, I, I missed the one that you just mentioned <laughs> that's one of their uh, endemic species like which bulbul i forget the name i think it's difficult to to call that one oh stian's bulbul yeah. okay yeah i i missed that one so yeah. i just have my question that uh what when is the best month to go birding and photography in taiwan and how many days should we spend oh i'm Unfortunately, I am not a bird guide. I can only tell you <laughs> about uh, when when the certain migratory species would be around. But I think Victor might be able to tell you when is when is the best time for photography, Victor. Well, Marty, you know, you, you, you go, go back to the the ABF uh, YouTube channel. You you you'll find the answer. You know, because um, uh, Mark Wilkie did a presentation last year, so you can get all the answers there. But give a very a brief uh, answer, like um. Seven days or to 10 or 15 days is, is great. Actually, you know, seven days to 10 days are good enough. 
And, okay. and you will see all the endemics, it's all year round, you know, there's, there's no season difference. Anytime you can see, you know, um, at least 20 to 22 endemics all of uh, the, the 30. Oh, however, Marty, something, yeah. something that is special and a little bit different is if you do come to Taiwan in the winter time, you could go to Kinmen Island because in Kinmen Island, you could see up to 140 species uh, it, on Kinmen <laughs> if you're there. <laughs> and so actually Kinmen is one of the very big uh, migratory bird hotspots for, for Taiwan. And, wow. But it, it's not on Ta it's not on Taiwan proper though, right? It's a, it's on Kinmen Island, and so actually something that uh, that uh, is interesting is that uh, Kinmen Island will have up to 140 different species there, and something like uh, 10,000 cormorants uh, as well in the winter time. However, if you go to Matsu Islands in uh, Matsu, if you go to Dongin in Matsu in the uh, April May, you might see different species every. Every every two to three days, because every, the the Palearctic migration is taking place. Wow! So that's, that's it's a, another hot spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, seeing Stein's bulbul, it's funny because if you go to Dashuishan, technically they say that you could see uh, twenty eight of the twenty nine uh, endemics in Dashuishan. But exactly. Stein's bulbul, I think, is the one. <laughs> Right. The one, the one that you can't get because it's over the mountain range, the central right. mountain range. So it's 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 the one you have to go across for. Yeah, that, Marty, that, that if you true. want to see all the endemics, you know, just just any time of, of the year, just go to the mountains and you get them. Yeah. Thank you very much, Victor, and thank you very much, Scott. Yeah, actually. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I went to Kimmen in, in, in January. I mm. got um, 120 species in, in four days. That's, that's very cool. And I'm going to Matu, especially the, the one of the islands of Matu, Dongin, next week. Mm. Hopefully, oh. I'll, I'll, I'll get a lot of birds. <laughs> that, that is the hope. That is the hope. Well, uh, oh. Scott, I want to know, you know, after the report was released, um, have you got any attention from from the government um well yeah i mean the government is very very interested in being able to learn about these topics and to know what the conservation community is concerned with so yeah especially from the the forestry bureau they have been talking with uh, with us about this and more recently actually even the um uh the ocean affairs council because now they are working on a seabird conservation, even though it's seabird, mostly seabird conservation around Taiwan Island, right? So they have also been looking at uh, the, the report as well. So there has been, so there has been interest from, from the government about this, yes. And any feedback from the society? Well, I mean, it could always be better, right? There could always be other species that you're discussing. There could always be other topics, bigger topics. So. The hope is that we will be able to collect all this feedback and pretty soon we're going to be holding the first meeting to discuss the next state of Taiwan birds because, you know, oh. getting everything together, because even though it will come out every two years, it's a very, very large undertaking. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, it, so we will be discussing what topics will be, will, will come up and what we might be providing updates on or what new species we might be uh, looking into for, for that, uh, for that paper. But, uh, but yeah, so it's underway at the moment. Yeah, I know it's, it's a project takes, you know, a, a, a huge uh, budget. Mm. And, uh, what if it, there's, there's, no, there's no budget? Do you think that it's possible to do it, you know, more or, or uh, further action? Uh, how do you mean? I mean, if, if there's no money, I mean, you know, because uh, I know oh. it takes a, a big, huge uh, budget, money mm. of it. Oh, you mean if there's no budget, could it come out yeah. more or could it? Uh, well, it, the, the thing is that, like I was saying, you know, I even though I'm reporting about the state of Taiwan birds, I can't say that it's, it's you know, I was just uh, the English editor and helper to write the English version. But the topics themselves were all studied and worked on via individual researchers, individual organizations. And, you know, it was a massive undertaking. So imagine, though, 
getting everybody to write the paper <laughs> and then tracking everybody down in order to give everything on time uh, when everybody is very, very busy. So uh, one of the major things was being able to, to get the reports from the, from the writers. <laughs> that, takes, that takes time. True, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Continuing the question. Uh, well, before we have a uh, next question, let's take a, a group photo first. Oh, okay. So at least I should forget about it. So um, guys, please turn on your camera. Gombo, Mohit. Sorry, Victor, I can't turn on the camera. Wow, it's this. getting dark. Uncle Wong, Uncle Wong is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, Paul. Are you still with us? Hi, Paul. Hello. Oh, mm -hmm. oh. he was yeah, there. I saw him a moment ago. Yeah, he mm -hmm. was on. Paul Schaffner. Yeah, hmm. Paul Schaffner. Sophia. Okay, uh, please look at the camera and smile, Job. Mm -hmm. right? Job, okay, one, two, three. Okay, that's our first group photo, thank you. Oh, All right, wow. let's go on. I'll hey, hi, questions. Scott. Oh, hello, Rajendra, how are you doing? Hi, hi, sorry, hey. It was really great to see your presentations. And now, oh. when you talk about it, it reminds me of my time in, uh, in uh, Taiwan. Mm. And I still remember seeing that uh, Spoonie, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. So how, oh. how are you and how's the things? Things, things, things are okay. Things <laughs> We're waiting for, every, for, the, for uh, everybody to be able to travel again so people can come to Taiwan to visit. Because we were very sad this year at the uh, at the uh, bird watching festival in Taipei that nobody was able to to join because uh, it was uh, because of the closure because of COVID. So we're all waiting here for the ability to see our friends again. Is it is it still closed? Yeah, for the most part, they just opened up a travel bubble though between Taiwan and Palau yesterday. Okay. okay. Yeah. So besides besides that. Uh, there hasn't, there's no, there, it's not really open yet here. How are, how are things by you? Yeah, I'm also fine. Um, Nepal, we've been, um, you know, having uh, some tourists in Nepal, but very mm. limited. Okay. Uh, um, today I got a, you know, the two people's pre approval, the you know, visa for the people to travel in. <laughs> oh, really? In yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very difficult now. And then yeah. we have you have to have a, like all sort of lots of documentations and things like that. Yeah, uh, to book it took me two days to get uh, all the mm. documentation to show down. So now wow. the people can travel to Nepal and they can stay. I mean, uh, literally five days quarantine. But uh, if mm. the people uh, have a negative reports once they arrive in country, then they can go to the destinations. So all destinations are open. Okay. We have a huge number of people, you know, large number of people are in Everest now. Oh, Mount really? Oh, my God. Everest is full of people now because the northern side from Tibet is close. So there's all the people moved to the southern side of Nepal. So oh. many people are heading up to Everest. Trekking oh. is very slow. Bird watching is almost none. Mm. Um, you know, the luxury, the tours are none. But we have a large number of people for uh, expeditions, you know, to Everest mm -hmm. and mountaineering. And we had some trekkers are started to come and hopefully mm. birders will come too. Mm. Nepal is open anyway now. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's, well, that's good to know. I mean, over here, they haven't really opened anything, anything yet. No, they haven't. But do they have certain countries that you're allowed to, uh, only certain countries people are allowed to come to Nepal or is Everybody. it anybody? Everybody, the only thing is earlier, the people can come as an individual, but now oh. that they have to have um, some uh, a local agency to go. Mm -hmm. Local agency has to, you know, to look after or handle all these documentations and everything. Mm. So um, there was uh, no restrictions. Any any country can come to 
Nepal. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly <Hopefully>. not. China. <laughs> Certainly not the Chinese people want to, you know, they come to Nepal because once they go back to home, they have to stay three weeks yeah. for time. So they will not be willing to travel. Yeah. But other countries. No. No. Yeah, uh, Paul is with us now. Good to see you, oh. Paul. And and Marty, can we do the the second group photo? Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's do Fair. it. Yeah, Marty. <laughs> okay. Oh, Marty, Kim Paul, Chong. And, and MJ. Mark. Kim Chong. All right, all right. Anyway, first job. Yeah. You guys. And Mohit. Job. And job. Okay, guys. Johnny. Look at the camera and smile. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Let's go on. Uh, no namaste. Namaste. Victor. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead if you have any questions. Yes. No, I don't have a question. <laughs> we have a question. Yeah, it's just catching up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Victor, you had a you know the wonderful photos you shared in Facebook yesterday or day before yesterday. Huh? That's oh, yeah. a, when you were very young, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> You're a superstar. <laughs> And you are still. Huh? <laughs> well, that, that's another point. You know, this is just go back to the skull. Any questions for skull? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Scott, when are you going to come to Nepal? Yeah. Uh, when when I get a chance. Because <laughs> 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 oh, it sounds great. <laughs> and I would like to go to do birding over there. And now I know a great guide. So. I I think so if anyone willing to come to Nepal, I think that the, this uh, this year is going to be a good one, a good time, because um, usually the other time we had uh, so many peoples in you know, most of the destination, mm -hmm. but now it's very quiet, you know? So mm -hmm. most of the areas, you have a lot of, uh, plenty of places to stay, you know, choose, and trails are quieter and less disturbance, especially the borders. It's very nice this time. Right, oh. thank you. Yeah, yeah so uh, again, Scott, it's a very good presentation. Yeah. Learned a lot from you. And yeah, maybe we will invite you again to talk about, you know. Um, yeah, something, uh, some other project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, civil science, great. Yeah, so, uh, sure, no yeah. problem. It's it's really it's nice to be able to join this uh, to join the event here and to to see all these uh, all these uh, faces that I know and uh, yeah. to to say hi to everybody again. Yeah, see, this uh, would be a good topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Mike, we are going next week. Oh, next week we're going yeah. to my country, the Philippines, with our oh, guest speaker right. Christina Cinco of the Wild Bird Club of the Philippines. Excellent. Christina is here with us tonight. <laughs> Hi, Christina. Look forward Hi, to Christina. your presentation next week. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thank you, Scott. Thank you, everybody, right. for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. We look forward to seeing you, you same time next week. Right? All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be in